Let's pray for a moment and really get our hearts attuned to the Word of God this morning. Our Father, we come to you now so thankful for your gift of a Bible, your gift of the Scriptures. We know who you are, we know who we are, and we know what you expect of us. We know our Savior, Jesus Christ. We know the Spirit of God. We know our triune God. We know our future for all who know Christ. We know the future of all who do not know Christ. And so you've given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. This morning, Lord, as we look into your word, may you pierce our hearts. May you make us lowly before you, moldable and changeable, so that we may be transformed from one degree of glory to another, sanctified to be like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Well, turn with me. First of all, to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. We're going to work our way to our main text this morning in Matthew 6. But we need to start on the road about 1,500 years before that and work our way toward Matthew's gospel. And I think you'll see that it'll be more easily understood if we take this little journey first. I don't know a Christian who would say... My prayer life is completely sufficient and glorious. I don't know anyone who says that. Every believer could stand to enlarge or enhance or enrich his prayer life. And for me personally, when I have the opportunity to to preach on prayer, for me it's like a drink of cool water. It refreshes my soul. It's good for me. And my hope is that it'll do the same for you as well. For that reason, I decided some time ago that when we reached Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, that I would slow our pace down in Matthew and we would just take time to savor this chapter, which is so vital to our prayer life, our communion with the Lord God himself. I don't know a Christian who would say my prayer life is completely glorious, completely sufficient, and I suppose I don't know a Christian either that has said, My goal in my prayer life is to be anemic, weak, and lacking in confidence. Throughout the centuries of the church, a great walk with the Lord is always accompanied by a great prayer life. Those two always go together. And so for this series, I'd like to steal a common line used in the charismatic circles, a concept they believe they've cornered the market on, and I'd like to call this series, How to Pray in Power. How to pray in power. And for every message from the text of Matthew 6, I'm going to focus on one aspect of praying in power. And today's kind of an introduction to that. But what does it mean to pray in power? I'd like to just start thinking about that. I have a concern that the charismatic movement, which began at the beginning of the 20th century, has consistently emphasized prayer but to the point of saying that they have cornered the market on the keys and the secrets to praying in power, particularly when associated with praying in tongues, the miraculous gift which ceased at the end of the apostolic age. They they regularly define tongues as a prayer language. Well, a, a basic study of the New Testament shows that the gift of tongues simply was the gift of being able to speak in a human language which you had never learned. We don't need that gift today. It has ceased with the apostles. But even that aside, the charismatic movement has been obsessed with powerful prayer. So what does that mean to them? One writer in an article entitled, Walking in Powerful Prayer Will Loose the Devil's Hold on You, that author says this, Through prayer you have the power to make things happen. This author says there are secrets to breaking through to victory. Now, the title alone reveals the warped and unorthodox heresy that somehow the devil has a hold on Christians who don't have the secret prayer power. The goal in charismatic theology is always this elusive breakthrough, which is never defined very well except in material terms such as wealth and health and and getting everything you desire. You'll never read helpful material in the charismatic world called, for example, How to Break Through to Suffer Well. Or how to break through to embrace your tragedy. You'll never read that because that blows their whole system of theology that says that God exists to solve all your problems. 
Another writer in an article called You Can Build a Powerful Prayer Life writes this. Prayer is a great force with the potential to move God. We must believe for God's power to manifest in our own lives. That sounds more like something Yoda would say than a Christian would say. In charismatic theology, prayer itself is the power, the force. And God is the passive being who's moved to do our bidding by this power of prayer. But the guru of all the gurus in the charismatic movement, the godfather of heresy, I like to call him, Kenneth Copeland, he's very open about his witchcraft-like views of prayer. He wrote an article that's been reprinted and redistributed ad nauseum for decades as a charismatic classic, and this article is called Intercession Provides the Holy Spirit with Opportunity. Oh, I'm so glad to provide God with something. He writes this, Why are we called to intercession? Because God does not do anything in the earth without the cooperation of a man. Prayer is the doorway into the mightiest release of power that is known to man. It brings the very presence of God to and upon man in any part of the world. That prayer operates, that power operates rather, as believers allow those rivers of living water to gush toward the dry and thirsty. And Copeland says that we must intercede in prayer for people to know all this because, quote, God's heart is hungry for a family. He says, you may groan out loud, you are releasing spiritual power. Intercession gives the Holy Spirit the opportunity to bring the fullness of God's will to pass on earth. Now, his view of God is clearly a heretical, weak, anemic God. God does not do anything in the earth without the cooperation of a man. I suppose things like creation come to mind. That's not even my point. For all these charismatic wanderers from the truth, prayer itself is an independent power. And it's portrayed much more like a witch's spell than like communion and glorious intimate fellowship with Almighty God. But if you're honest, you can see why the charismatic movement continues to attract millions upon millions of people with very little or no emphasis or mention of the biblical gospel and a total emphasis on getting God to do things for you. Because the idea of powerful prayer is attractive to us. So what does powerful prayer mean to the unorthodox charismatic It means using God for my purposes. And if I can do that successfully, now my prayer is powerful. And so we understand how heretical and how wrong that is. But isn't there a little part of you that says, but I do want to pray in power. I do want to live a life that's characterized by a record of answered prayer and communion with God. I mean, after all, James 5.16 says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Don't you want that? Well, you can have that, and you don't have to resort to charismatic heresy, made-up theology, which turns God into a cosmic vending machine and turns you into Luke Skywalker to pray with power. So what is exactly the idea of praying in power? Well, we'll spend the next couple of months exploring that. But there is a starting point to praying in power, and it's a surprising starting point. We're going to work our way toward that very systematically this morning because to pray in power begins with a posture in prayer, an attitude, a disposition, not a physical posture. Scripture has examples of people praying in every physical posture from on your faces before God, with your heads bowed, with your heads looking up, with your eyes closed, with your eyes open, seated, lying down, standing. No, I'm talking about the heart posture, the position of the heart, the attitude, the bearing that you bring to prayer. And to help us grasp this particular posture of prayer, I want to walk through some examples of this posture in prayer, and we'll label each one of us, one of them to help us identify this posture in prayer. So we're going to have some sub-labels and then we'll put it all together to identify this particular posture in prayer. 
really has to be our starting point. And we're going to start here in Exodus 30. I'm going to explain the text briefly and then we'll label it to help us move toward identifying this posture in prayer. God here is giving Moses the particulars of the tabernacle, the traveling worship center for Israel after they had escaped Egypt. The worship center's most important feature was the most holy place or the holy of holies in which the Ark of the Covenant would be placed. This is the representative throne of God on earth. Outside the most holy place was the holy place, an outer room which led into the most holy place. And in the holy place, this outer room, there was to be placed in front of the curtain, in front of the veil, which led into the most holy place, there was to be an altar of incense. Verses 1 through 6 of Exodus 30 describes this altar of incense. It was small. It was about 18 to 20 inches square and about 3 feet high. And it was to be overlaid with pure gold. The altar of incense was the central feature of the holy place, right in front of the curtain. You had to go past it to get into the most holy place. Now, all of the furniture items that are described in Exodus for the tabernacle, they have a relationship to prayer in that the tabernacle was God's ordained means for connecting with his people. And that's a a clear reference to prayer. But the altar of incense is especially important when thinking about prayer. Scripture makes a very strong case for the incense, these burning uh, uh, oils and and scents to be directly representative of prayer, of communication with God. Psalm 142, verse 2, the psalmist asks that his prayers be like incense before God. And you can can hear the imagery or or sense it of, of it rising up. Revelation 5, 8 speaks of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Revelation 8, 4, the smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of the saints. Leviticus 16 describes that on the annual day of atonement, the day that the high priest was able to enter into the most holy place, he must bring the fire and the incense with him or he would die. That there must be communion, there must be communication with God. And so the altar of incense is clearly connected to prayer. The symbol of the smoke of the incense rising upward lends itself very naturally to the image of prayer. And scripture bears this out. And here in Exodus 30, 1 through 6, there's tremendous specificity and detail given as to the exact plans and the construction of this altar of incense. It's not big, but it's very precise. Even the design was to be in full compliance with the word of God. And just like the design of the physical things associated with approaching God were to be specific and obedient, the spiritual things of approaching God are to be in accordance with his word, in full compliance. And in fact, in the next several verses, there are three qualities of service at the altar of incense, and they're very specific. The first quality we could call continual burning. Continual burning. Verse 7, Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. He shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamps. When Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be continual incense before Yahweh throughout your generations. The continual burning is strongly related to prayer as it symbolizes that saturation in prayer is to be representative and characteristic of tabernacle worship, that you don't worship God without prayer. There's continual burning. There's a second quality of the service at the altar of incense. We would call this careful obedience. Careful obedience. Verse 9, you shall not offer any strange incense on this altar or burnt offering or grain offering, then you shall not pour out a drink offering on it. What is this strange incense? Anything other than what is prescribed. Notice the importance of total submission, total compliance. Look near the end of the chapter, verse 34 Verse 34, then Yahweh said to Moses, take for yourself fragrances, stacti and anica and galbanum and fragrances with pure frankincense. There shall be an equal part of each. With it, you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine and you shall put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you and it shall be most holy to you. 
The incense which you shall make, you shall not make in the same specifications for yourselves. It shall be holy to you for Yahweh. Whoever shall make any like it to use his perfume shall be cut off from his people. There is an exact mixture that is to be used and it's not to be used for any other purpose. You weren't as a priest to take some home to your wife because it smells so good. It was evidently a sweet and, and, and beautiful smelling incense. And so it would be tempting to use this mixture for personal use. Leviticus 10 tells us just how serious God was about this when Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, learned just how seriously God takes obedience to worship him only in the way prescribed. They offered strange fire, very likely a different mixture of incense. And fire came out from the sanctuary and consumed them. The key to this whole concept is found here in verse 37, the end of verse 37, it shall be holy to you for Yahweh. What does that tell us? It tells us that the incense, the prayers are to bless God. Therefore Him, therefore His sake, therefore His enjoyment. Prayer is not to tolerate any foreign oddities which are devoid of being for God's sake, for God's glory. There's purity of motive. There's concern for God's honor. And so there are these qualities of continual burning, careful obedience. There's a third quality, confession of sin. Confession of sin, verse 10 of chapter 30. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. He shall make atonement on it with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once a year, Throughout your generations, it is most holy to Yahweh. The altar of incense, as I mentioned a moment ago, Leviticus 16, is directly offered and involved on the Day of Atonement, this annual national day of repentance and forgiveness. And so prayer is vitally connected, listen carefully, to cleanness before God, cleanliness before God. Prayers from an unclean people are unacceptable. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I see wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. The whole point of Exodus 30 is that the prayers are not merely, listen carefully, the prayers are not merely unto God. They are for God. They're for Him. And so how would we label Exodus 30? We would label it that prayer blesses God. Prayer blesses God. Prayer is first and foremost for God. Prayer isn't somehow filling a need that God has. He has no needs. He's utterly self-sufficient. But prayer is first and foremost for God's sake, for God's glory, for God's honor, for God's worth. So this posture of prayer we're working toward is first illustrated by the fact that prayer blesses God. This posture of prayer blesses God. Turn forward to Ruth chapter 2, if you would. And we're hitting some familiar stories this morning. The book of Ruth is the story of the Moabite woman, Ruth. She had married an Israelite man and was then widowed. She followed her also widowed mother-in-law, Naomi, now basically destitute, back to Bethlehem where they were from, or where Naomi was from, rather, They're in a desperate situation. You have two widows with no apparent prospects. And so Ruth, according to the law of Moses, went out very humbly to work hard, to glean grain from fields during harvest time, to pick from the corners left untouched. This is hard work. It's potentially dangerous work. Being out alone among all the hired workers of the the, the farmers in the area, a young woman alone, very, very risky. But you know the story. In God's providential plan, Ruth came upon the field of a wealthy man, Boaz, who happened to be one of Naomi's dead husband's relatives. This is now a a potential savior for Naomi and Ruth. Boaz protected Ruth. He kept her around other young women. He commanded his young men not to touch her. Boaz fed her a generous lunch, and he secretly commanded his men to leave a lot of extra grain behind so that she left with a huge haul of grain in one day. And so Ruth takes the grain back to Naomi, and it's a lot. And Naomi pronounces two blessings, two prayers. 
Ruth 2.19. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. This is a prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. Why is this a beautiful prayer? This is a destitute widow praying for the Lord's blessing on an already wealthy, already blessed man. There's no sense of jealousy. There's no sense of, well, of course he should have helped you. There's gratitude. There's lowliness and a genuine desire for God to bless this unknown man. But then, the second half of verse 19, so she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Oh, now Naomi found out that this man was a relative, a potential savior for them. And now she prays a second prayer. Verse 20, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of Yahweh who has not forsaken his loving kindness to the living and to the dead. Then Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. It's clear to Naomi that God is using Boaz to protect her, to protect Ruth and to provide for them. And of course, we know the rest of the story. Boaz knew who Ruth was and he wasn't an idiot. He ended up saving the family by marrying Ruth. But what I want to point out is that Naomi's prayers, there's no hint of jealousy. There's no hint of entitlement. Naomi, a widow and nearly destitute, is so gracious that she prays for God's great blessing to rain down on a man who had infinitely more than she had. And so we could label this description of the posture of prayer we're driving at, that this posture of prayer elevates others. This elevates others. And so this posture of prayer, we're we're working toward identifying, first, it blesses God. Second, it elevates others. Let's keep adding to this posture of prayer. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 1, another well-known prayer in the Bible. In the redemptive history of the Old Testament, 1 Samuel begins moving the time of the judges toward the time of the kings by means of the prophet Samuel, But Samuel, humanly speaking, was born because of the prayers of his mother, Hannah. You recall that Hannah was one of the two wives of Elkanah, and Hannah could not have children. In God's plan, according to verse 5, Yahweh had closed her womb. And year after year, the family went to the house of the Lord, located at this period in Shiloh. And there they would offer their prescribed sacrifices. This is a time where from this very simple sense, you're closest to God. You're, you're nearest to God. And so during this time, Hannah would cry and she would, she would weep to God for a child. And it wasn't helped by the fact that the other wife seemed to have babies at will. 1 Samuel 1, verse 10. And she, bitter of soul, prayed to Yahweh and wept despondently. And she made a vow and said, O Yahweh of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a seed amongst men, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life and the razor shall never come on his head. Verse 10, she is bitter of soul. It's a word that means she's desperate. She's desperate. Also in verse 10, she wept despondently. In Hebrew, it's an emphatic point. It's the repetition of the word to weep. The two verbs could be translated loosely that she continued weeping in her weeping. And so in verse 10, her prayer to God is bookended by bitterness of soul and despondent weeping. Or if we could put it this way, it's bookended by what was happening inside and what was happening outside. Inside, she has bitterness of whole uh, of soul, despondency, and outside, she's weeping without stopping. And her prayer shows just how much she desired this good and godly thing, a son. She asked the Lord to give her a son, and if he would do so, then her son would be set apart as a Nazarite, devoted to the service of God. She would give him back. She would give him back. And of course, God answered her prayer. Verse 20, 
Now it happened in due time that Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of Yahweh. And so her prayer is in the midst of anguish. She's completely transparent. She's even weeping before the Lord, and she's even willing to give up Samuel to the Lord. There's no sense of deserving. There's no sense of privilege. There's no sense of right. She's utterly powerless. And so we could label Hannah's prayer as a prayer that admits desperation. A prayer that admits desperation. And we're working our way toward this posture in prayer. This posture of prayer blesses God. It elevates others. It admits desperation. Let's go to another classic prayer. Job chapter 1. In Job 1, we see the story of the sovereignty of God in the midst of suffering. God has permitted Satan to strike Job with the death of his children, the loss of all of his property. And in one of the greatest examples of what true biblical worship actually is, right at the end of Job chapter 1, after having news of his property and his sons and daughters all being gone, Job 1, verse 20. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. Yahweh gave, and Yahweh has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. I want you to know this, that Job makes two parallel proclamations of theological truth. The first two are anthropological, about the theology of mankind, and the second two are theological, theology proper, about the theology of God himself. And they're parallel. Let me show you this. First, he says that he came from his mother's womb naked with nothing, and he'll leave this earth, pictured as returning with nothing. That's his declaration of truth about mankind. You come to the world naked, you leave naked. And in parallel fashion, he makes a declaration of truth about God. That God gives, that's parallel to mankind coming from the womb, and God takes away. That's parallel to the end of life, mankind departing this world. This is as clear a comparison between mankind and God as you'll find in Scripture. Mankind comes and goes with nothing, and God is the one who gives, and God is the one who takes away. It is a theological declaration par excellence. Job affirms that he is nothing and God is everything. Job has no power, no possessions, and God has all power and all possessions. Why is this so important? Job is affirming that what will happen to him at death, that he leaves this world with nothing, has merely happened to him while he's still alive. It's just a precursor. All has been taken from him. And he blesses God. And notice the assessment of this prayer and Job's response to his trial at this point. Verse 22, through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he give offense to God. How is Job praying? What is his attitude? We could label Job's prayer as one that crushes self. This is a prayer that crushes self. There's no pride in this prayer. There's no subtle belief that he deserves anything. He basically says, well, I was going to leave this world with nothing. I just have a preview of what that's like. He crushes self. The posture of prayer we're going after so far, this posture of prayer blesses God, elevates others, admits desperation, crushes self. Turn with me to Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah 14, God is judging the southern kingdom of Judah for covenant treachery. There's a drought, water is scarce, animals are suffering even. And so Jeremiah intercedes on behalf of the Israelites. They're they're rebellious and he admits this and, and and he goes to the Lord. Jeremiah 14, we see the beginning of Jeremiah's intercession in this situation. Jeremiah 14, verse 7. This is Jeremiah speaking to God, his prayer. 
Although our iniquities answer against us, O Yahweh, act for your name's sake. Truly our acts of faithlessness have been many. We have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its Savior in time of distress, why are you like a sojourner in the land or like a traveler who has pitched his tent to lodge for the night? Why are you like a man confused, like a mighty man who cannot save? Yet you are in our midst, O Yahweh, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. Jeremiah is pleading with God to act and to be loyal to Israel, to be, verse 8, the hope of Israel. And Jeremiah expresses how this feels to him, that God isn't acting. It seems like God is like uh, like a traveler who's just passing through or like a a confused man who, who doesn't seem to know what to do. Now, Jeremiah doesn't believe this about God, but he says, God, this is what it seems like you're doing. And God's answer is shocking. Verse 10, thus Yahweh says to this people, even so they have loved to wander. They have not kept their feet in check. Therefore, Yahweh does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. So Yahweh said to me, do not pray for the good of this people. When they fast, I am not going to listen to their cry. When they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I am not going to accept them. Rather, I'm going to make an end of them by the sword, famine, and pestilence. God is resolved to judge the sin of this people and he tells Jeremiah not to pray. And so what does Jeremiah do? Jeremiah prays. Verse 13. But, ah, Lord Yahweh, I said, behold, the prophets are saying to them, you will not see the sword nor will you have famine, but I will give you true peace in this place. So Jeremiah is pointing out that there's false prophets walking around telling people that God is going to bless them. There's no reference to sin, no reference to justice, just that God won't let bad things happen. Or if I could put it this way, the prosperity gospel has always been plaguing God's people. But God corrects this and he points out in verses 14 through 18 that these are false prophets and they will have their own reckoning. God will deal with them. And so again, God is giving Jeremiah the message, I am determined to judge. In other words, do not pray for this people. And so what does Jeremiah do? Jeremiah prays. Verse 19. Have you completely rejected Judah or have you loathed Zion? Why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? We hoped for peace, but there was no good. And for a time of healing, but behold, terror We know our wickedness, O Yahweh, the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not despise us for your own name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the idols of the nations who give rain or can the heavens give showers? Is it not you, O Yahweh, our God? Therefore, we hope in you, for you are the one who has done all these things. What a prayer. Jeremiah is throwing himself on on God's mercy, throwing Judah on God's mercy. Why? Verse 21, for your own name's sake. Surely that will move God. Well, God answers again, chapter 15, verse 1. Then Yahweh said to me, even though Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my soul would not be with this people. Send them away from my presence and let them go. He says, Yeah, nice prayer, but even Moses and Samuel aren't getting their way on this one. Verse 3, I will appoint over them four kinds of doom, declares Yahweh, the sword to kill, the dogs to drag off, and the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth to devour and bring to ruin. Even Moses and Samuel don't get their prayers answered at this point. In other words, don't pray for this people. And you're starting to figure out what is Jeremiah going to do? He's going to pray. Verse 10, woe to me, my mother, that you have borne me as a man of strife and a man of contention to all the land. This is Jeremiah telling the Lord, don't make me go out and pronounce this misery and destruction on God's people again. I don't want to be the man of strife. I don't want to be bringing bad news all the time. I'd rather have not been born. In verse 11, God compassionately promises Jeremiah that Jeremiah personally will be safe when judgment comes. Jeremiah 39 records the fulfillment of that promise. 
But in verses 12 through 14, God declares that all the wealth, all the treasure, all the goodness, all the glory, all the, the wonder and delight of Israel will be carried off. In other words, do not pray for this people. Now, God was in fact determined to punish the Israelites for their covenant unfaithfulness. And this would be most harshly accomplished by the invasion of the Babylonians. But the greater context of Jeremiah reminds us that God had a a bigger, more grand plan in mind, larger in scope than just the punishment of Israel. For example, chapters 50 and 51 contain a long declaration by God of the coming destruction of Babylon. Why? How dare you come against my people Israel? That's a sovereign God acting in sovereign fashion. And of course, God promises that his wrath against Israel will be spent. It will come to an end. Jeremiah 31, at that time, declares Yahweh, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says Yahweh, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when it went to find its relief, Yahweh appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Again, I will build you and you will be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go forth to the dances of those celebrating. But I simply want to point out three things. First, God repeatedly told Jeremiah to stop praying for Israel. Second, Jeremiah repeatedly continued to pray for Israel. And third... God never rebuked Jeremiah for continuing to pray. He never did. What was Jeremiah doing? What was the essence of his persistent refusal to stop praying? Well, we could label Jeremiah's prayers as prayer which pleads grace. Prayers which pleads grace, requests grace, begs for grace. Now, we're, we're still working toward this posture of prayer which yields the true power, the, the posture of prayer we're going for. This posture of prayer blesses God, elevates others, admits desperation, crushes self, pleads grace. This is powerful prayer. This is the correct way to think about prayer. So what is this posture in prayer? What is blessing God, elevating others, admitting desperation, crushing self, And pleading grace, what does it add up to? What is this posture? It is a posture of total humility. That's the posture. That's where the power is. That's where you have to start. A posture of total humility. This is a far cry from through prayer, you have the power to make things happen. Or prayer is a great force with the potential to move God. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 verse 5. Now what we read of Jesus beginning teaching on prayer is easily understood, easily grasped. Matthew 6 verse 5. Matthew 6 verse 5. And when you pray... You are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street, on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus condemns the hypocrites who pray with the specific purpose of being seen, being heard. They're they're thinking nothing of God. They're thinking only of being viewed by God's people as pious and holy. In fact, there were specific times of the day that were prescribed for prayer. And how easy it would be to just happen to be walking down the street. Oh, look, it's 12 o'clock, time to pray. Coincidentally, I'm standing at the most busy intersection in the city. You could demonstrate just how righteous and pious you were. Now, Jesus isn't making a prohibition against public prayer. The early church rightly prayed with one another. But he's instructing on the posture of prayer, that of humility. He says to go into the inner room, someplace where there's no windows, where nobody can see, nobody can be impressed, nobody can even know. 
This is to commune in privacy with God. He's giving a prescription to radically dealing with the tendency toward, prayer, toward pride. Prayer where nobody knows, where nobody sees. And you remember last time we saw his admonition about giving in verses 1 through 4 where you're trying to demonstrate your own piety by giving in a way that everybody knows about it. And in the same way, he says that the one who prays in public with this pious, proud attitude, they've already got their, all their reward. Let me put it to you this way. Power in prayer is paradoxical. It's paradoxical. The powerful prayer begins with weakness. It begins with helplessness. It begins with degradation. It begins with a posture of total humility. It begins by expressing your heart to the Lord in humble quietness, in the inner room, so to speak. And listen, Jesus beginning teaching on prayer in this this chapter isn't merely a lesson to the believer about being humble in prayer. It's a lesson on the hypocrite. Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites. Oh, what does that tell us? Unbelievers, false believers can pray. They prayed. What does this tell us? This tells us that just the act of prayer proves nothing about your standing before God. Here's an example of somebody who prayed. Cain. Cain prayed after murdering his brother Abel. Genesis 4 and 9, Yahweh said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain lies to God and denies responsibility. By the way, yes, he was his brother's keeper. God pronounces punishment on Cain, and Cain thinks only of himself. Genesis 4, 13, my punishment is too great to bear. And Cain was sentenced by God to be a wanderer in the world, and the first Cain thing that Cain did was to settle and stop wandering, immediate rebellion. So Cain's response to God in prayer is angry, it's prideful, it's untruthful. He refused to confess sin, he refused to repent. My point is, is that unbelievers pray. Unbelievers pray. Turn to Matthew 7, near the end of the chapter for a moment. Here's the final arrogant prayer of the unbeliever, the false Christian, the hypocrite. Matthew 7, 21, the final prayer. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, here's the final prayer of the hypocrite. Lord, Lord, in your name did we not prophesy and in your name cast out demons and in your name do many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Here's a question. Precisely where are they departing to? Revelation 20, 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire most often described in the New Testament with the Greek word Gehenna is translated hell. Hell is referred to by name by Jesus 14 times, but he also called it eternal fire, eternal punishment, the place of weeping, the place of gnashing of teeth, the place of darkness. And someone might say, I don't believe in hell, I just believe in Jesus. Well, how about this one? Revelation 14.10 calls hell the place of torment with fire and brimstone which lasts forever and ever. And you know who's presiding over hell? The holy angels and the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the very one, according to Revelation 20, who will cast all unbelievers into hell, all hypocrites. And someone might say, well, my Jesus would never do that. That's because your Jesus, the Jesus of your imagination, doesn't exist. See, the hypocrites who pray to be seen as religious, the hypocrites of Matthew 7 who do churchy things to be seen as religious, the issue is an eternal one. They are not saved. Instead, Instead, Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
Peter said in Acts 2, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans 3 says that no one will be justified by doing good. Every mouth will be shut. Every person held accountable before God. There's only one way to be righteous through God, to God, and that is Romans 8, 3, 22, through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There's no piety. There's no good thing you can do. There's nothing you do that God is impressed with. Not one thing. In fact, the more you think you're impressing God, the more disgusted he is with you. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. In Titus 3, he saved us not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Now, why do I tell you this? Because if you think for one moment that your prayers or your acts of churchiness, or if you're Catholic, going to confession or doing penance, or by thinking that your good works will somehow outweigh your bad works, If you think that, God says in Romans 3, there is no one who does good. No one. Your good works are disgusting before God. You're guilty, according to James 2, verse 10, of breaking every law of God. Because if you violate His holiness in one way, you violated His holiness in every way. That makes you a murderer, a liar, a thief, an adulterer, a pervert, a scoundrel of every sort. Don't think that God will be impressed by an act of fake religiosity. Well, I pray, I read my Bible, I do the occasional nice thing, I even go to church. That's the eternal error of the prideful, false believer who justifies himself. Listen to two examples of public prayer. One which shows someone headed to hell and one which shows someone headed to heaven, made right before God. Jesus tells this story in Luke 18. He told a parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying these things to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, for those of you who know Christ, who have rightly humbled and humiliated yourself before God by repenting of your sin, coming by faith and faith alone with no appeal to your disgusting efforts at good works, For you who may find power, ironically, in the humility of prayer, you find your inner room. You find your secret place. And in that secret place, the wonders and the marvels of heaven are opened up to you. Because power comes from humility. Our dear brother, now home with the Lord, Dr. R.C. Sproul, he wrote a hymn based in Psalm 91. It's my favorite hymn in our hymnal. He wrote this. Who dwells within his most secret place is never far from his blessed grace. Neath his great shadow all will be well. No better place now for us to dwell. The secret place of God most high the shadow of our mighty king, the dwelling place where angels cry is where our praise will forever ring. You must know Christ. And if you know Christ, you must approach him in humility. That's the power, is humility. Our Father, we come to you now. And as a symbol of this humility, we bow our heads we, we look away from the holiness. We look away from the, the majesty and the awe and the, the wonder of our white, hot, holy God. 
I pray for each person here, first and foremost, all listening, that those who don't know you would be warned in their spirit that all the, the pious prayers they've ever prayed are worthless, and in fact, they increase the fire of your wrath. And for all who do know you, Lord, remind us that we approach you with humility, with lowliness of heart, with desperation, revealing to you the anguish of our own heart, our helplessness, our weakness, that therein lies the power. We bless you and we thank you for giving us the opportunity to communicate with you, for opening the the doors of the heavenly throne room And hearing our prayers, what a mighty and great and gracious God you are. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.